want to trust God for that. But I also perceive in my spirit that God would want to do some surgical work tonight. Some, 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 uh, uh, some prophetic precision in some people's lives here. And I don't know who it is, but I can feel a draw on my spirit. I can feel a draw on my spirit. I can feel a draw on my spirit. Glory to God. Hallelujah. So receive it in the name of Jesus. I trust that the grace is available to minister to many of you in that direction by the good grace of God. But what I usually do as well when I teach, what I, what, what I, the way I minister is called prophetic preaching. So sometimes you don't have to uh, wait for me to say you stand up and this, that, and the other. If you pay attention to the word as it flows, it is very, very likely that you'll catch your word. You'll catch your word, and when you catch it, you run with it in the mighty name of Jesus. Nehemiah 8 is where we have been, and we've said many, many things there. Uh, our, uh, uh, we looked at verse number 3. He read unto them before the street that was before the water gate, and from morning until midday before the men and women, and all those that could understand and the ears of all the people are attentive unto the book of the law. In verse number 6, the Bible says, And Ezra blessed the Lord and the great God. And all the people answered, Amen, Amen, with the lifting up of their hands. And they bowed their heads and worshipped the Lord with their faces to the ground. The people worshipped the Lord with their faces to the ground. Uh, the people worshipped the Lord. He gave uh, uh, the word. He began to declare the word. He began to read from the book. Remember, in the beginning, they are crying out for the book. And uh, they respond to the book. Uh, they respond to the book. Uh, they respond to the book. I want to uh, 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 paint the picture of the demand on personal relationship that the book is laying as a burden for all of us that are people of the book. Uh, the good lady has already started to lay that foundation very well, and I'm so glad with what you've shared that just uh, allows me to simply take off uh, uh, from that foundation. Glory to God. That our hearts will be ready, that our hearts will be prepared, that our personal life will be ready to carry the personal responsibility uh, of the relationship that the book demands. Glory to God. Uh, we've talked about the book immensely and intensely, and I would like to make it very personal in your life today and let you know that by the book and through the book, God is demanding for relationship. Like a crazy lover that just needs your time. Like a crazy lover that just needs your space. He just will not let you go. I know the last time you had a guy like that, you ran for dear life, and I don't want to say God is mad with you, but he's madly in love with you, that he would like to spend time and to have a, a chemistry and to have a, a revelation, to have a uh, if it was a situation of lovers, would simply call it romance. Romance between your soul and the book. That your soul will dance around the book. That you Have you ever read the word and it's so preciously deep uh, meeting the situation of your life that you feel like you need to hug somebody? You feel like God has spread his hands around you to hug you and to make you feel loved and beloved of the Lord. Glory, hallelujah. I've had so many moments like that where I'm laboring over something and praying over something and all of a sudden from the scriptures it comes so alive like I feel like I'm in a meeting with God and is sharing some things that I could never get from any board meeting or any kind of uh, 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 any manner of jurisdiction glory to God uh, because God has made it available through the relationship through the relationship through the relationship my intention tonight is from everything that we've said already that I will leave you madly in love uh, with the book at a personal level that you will have what those with weaker language will call an affair uh, with the re book, the relationship with the book. That you, you think about it. I mean, you, you, you draw into it. That it draws into your space. You have other things you're working on and you have other things you're paying attention to. Uh, but the word and the book is drawing onto you and calling onto you. Glory to God. In Kenya, they say, come, baby, come, and come, baby, come, that you'll hear the book uh, draw and, uh, and call on a, on a come, baby, come, and a come, baby, come, that you will be drawn in the lines of the glory of God, the grace of God, the honor, and the revelation from on high, because your heart is attached 
as lovers may be attached in romance, that your heartbeat, like she said, uh, is moving on the rhythm of the book. Glory to God. Apparently, that's what God is going to dance to. And God is going to respond to. And I like the picture you've painted, oh, woman of God, that when God begins to dance, the earth will, the earth will shake. Glory to God. The, the movement of the earth is going to respond to the movement of God. That's exactly what happened at Calvary. You remember? Hallelujah. Uh, 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 that the, the, the movement of uh, the burden of the of the world upon the Lamb of God that taketh away the sin of the world. God moves and he looks away and all of a sudden the place is dark. Glory to God. Uh, when he said it is finished, the wrath and the judgment of God has come upon the Lamb of God that will take away the sin of the world. The Bible say there was an earthquake. Glory to God. Shook so mercy that there are dead men that walked out of their graves and if you believe the good book, the Bible say they were seen walking in Jerusalem. Oh, hallelujah. So what I'm saying here is what Job says in chapter 23 and verse number 12, that your word have I desired or esteemed more than my necessary food. There is a level of necessary food and there is an estimation of certain things like the word of God or rather the book that is estimated and desired above necessary food. That you can be stuck up in the realm and the zone of the love of the book that you forget about what is laid on the table, that you forget about when is the last time you had sex, that you forget about what the desires of your physical body may be. I know you look like you didn't hear it, but I'm talking to you. I told you I do prophetic preaching, glory to God, and some of your God just spoke to you right there, because there's a relationship uh, between the flow of the book and the word, and the word of God with where you are right now, glory to God. We must understand the relationship. Many, many, many years ago, when I just began to drive and getting involved with cars, one time the car that I was driving, then I had a situation. And every time I'd put my brakes or go into parking, the vibration would be happening under the bonnet. And, and as a young amateur driver, I would imagine there's something with my brakes. And one evening I went to the make and I said, guy, there must be something with my brakes because when I, when I put the brakes and go into parking, the thing just begins to vibrate. He began to teach me now about certain elements that are called engine mounting. And they were the ones that were broken. But I like the way he said it because he told me, you know what? There is actual between the mounting and the brakes, there is completely no relationship. So this has nothing to do with your brakes. We just need to focus on what the problem is. And in this case, it was the engine mounting. There is no relationship. Now, that, that is interesting and intriguing because there are many of us like that engine under the bonnet. We are in the church and we seem to be running around like, a, I mean, when people look at us, they really think we are born again. They really think we're Lord Jesus. They really believe we are in the church, but Abba Father knows that as a matter of fact, between the bricks and the, and the, and the mounting, there is no relationship. He looks at you and there is no sense or point of reference whatsoever because of the state of your alignment with the book, your alignment with his word, your alignment with his agenda. Glory to God. You are a child of God because you carry his burden. You are a child of God. The exchange at the cross is it's the burden exchange. He says, come unto me, all of you that labor under heavy laden, and I will do what? I will give you rest. That's the exchange. He says, learn from me, for my burden is easy, and my burden is light. My yoke is easy, and my burden is light. In other words, give me what you have. I will give you what I got. And if you carry what God got, you are done for the rest of your life. Somebody say hallelujah. I say you are done for the rest of your life. Because when God gives you his burden, your heartbeat is going to become his heartbeat. Your dance is going to become his dance. His cry is going to become your cry. Somebody say hallelujah. Oh, blessed be God forever. When we talk relationship with a book, we are talking about your commitment. We are talking about your alignment. We are talking about your depth. What is the depth of your relationship? To what degree? Some of us are so light and our relationships are lightly esteemed that you love a guy for three years and you don't even know you love him. Hallelujah. 
I say hallelujah. Some of us are so lightly esteemed on our relationships that you really think you're in love with that girl until she brings your wedding card. She even gives you an assignment that according to our wedding committee, they said you're the one who is going to fetch the water that will wash the cars, the bridal cars. But all this time you thought you're in love, but it was so lightly esteemed that it did not have value. It did not have honor. They did not even know that there is a sense of love. Glory to God. Why don't they know? Because the power to speak was not available. The power to communicate. She has spoken very well on communication. The word, the bottom word in communication is the word to commune. Glory to God. We call it the table of communion because there he is communicating with us. The next time you have communion, listen to this, you are communicating. It is a reflection of relationship. Hallelujah. So the preacher today would like you to begin to gather the relationship between you and the book. There must be a relationship between you and the book. There must be a relationship within you and the book. Even in the physical sense that when you see it, you are not strangers. That when you look at your Bible, it doesn't look at you like, where have you been? I mean, some of these girls have such attitude. If you don't talk to her for three weeks, you show up. I mean, she's going to make you feel like you're the devil's cousin. Don't let the book have attitude or you have attitude around the book because your relationship is intense. Somebody say hallelujah. Your relationship is deep. Your relationship is intense. I want to read your scripture here in the book of Ezra because we are looking at Ezra in the, in the book of Nehemiah but apparently Ezra uh, wrote a book in his own name and in chapter number 7 of the book of Ezra if you look at verse number 8, the Bible declares, And he came to Jerusalem in the fifth month, which was the seventh year of the king. For upon the first day of the first month, began he to go up to Babylon. And the first day of the fifth month came he unto Jerusalem, according to the good hand of God that was upon his life. Look at verse number 10. For Ezra prepared his heart to seek the law of the Lord and to do it and to teach it in Israel uh, statutes and judgment. Glory to God. For Ezra had prepared his heart to seek the Lord. Look at verse number 11. Now, this is the copy of the letter that the king at Texas gave to Ezra, the priest, uh, the scribe, even the scribe of the words of the commandment of the Lord and his statutes to Israel. At uh, Texas, king of kings, and to Ezra the priest, a scribe of the law of God of heaven perfect peace to you at such a time. I don't know if you see what I see, but the man prepared his heart to seek the law of the Lord. And that preparation that marinates his heart to engage at such an intense level of relationship with the book begin to give him credentials. That the king is writing to him, giving him an assignment which is the burden of the Lord that he may be able to go to Jerusalem and begin to do with the people of God one, two, and three. But Listen to the credential by which he is addressed. The letter is written from the king of kings. And it says it is written to Ezra the priest, the scribe, even the scribe of the words of the commandment of the Lord our God and his uh, statutes to Israel. The, uh, Ezra the priest, a scribe of the law of the Lord God of heaven. The gentleman's heart is so prepared in the search and in the seeking of the wonderful good book uh, that his own reflection by the king and all those that know him, he's called Ezra, the scribe of the law of the Lord God of the Most High. Even his statutes in Israel. Oh, hallelujah. I say hallelujah. I know you want to be called the honorable member. Some of you want to be called the professor of the dean of the faculty. Uh, some of you want to be called the reverend doctor. I don't know what it is that you love to be called. But listen to Ezra here. He's called the scribe. Even a scribe of the words of God. The commandments of the Lord our God. And his statutes in Israel. No wonder this guy was able to find the book. In a generation where they've just come out of, of bondage and they don't seem to have an idea. They hear stories, but they've never had the book. In such a generation, there is a man that if you ask him for the book, he will pick it up and he will begin to exegete it. He will begin to express it. He will begin to bring it down before the people in a generation where they don't seem to have a clue that God has even ever spoken to a people. 
What is their history in Israel's life is a reality because he has a relationship. Man, the king talks about Ezra and he says, Ezra is not only a priest, but is a scribe of the Most High. Do you know that your engagement with the book can be so serious that your own reflections are as good as the book itself? I don't think you understand what I'm talking about. But Ezra writes as a scribe and the things that he writes become the expression of the word of God. Oh, glory to God. Just excuse my language, but let me educate you just a little bit. Do you know that when Paul is writing to the Romans, to the Galatians, to the Corinthians, to the Ephesians, to Titus, to Timothy, these are personal renditions of his own later to the churches that he has planted and ministered to. And now he's in a jail in Rome under house arrest and is not able to go to these places. He began to write them later to my son, Timothy. Ha, ha, ha. To the church. Church, uh, that, uh, uh, that is in Corinth uh, and my brother Apollos uh, and, uh, and, uh, and uh, Priscilla and Aquila. He writes to, uh, to Timothy and said, Damas uh, has forsaken me. But when you are coming, please carry my books uh, and carry my cloak. But the guy is in private uh, business. And yet it is so in sync with the book that his own private affair in a letter, God confirms. And he says, that is canon of scripture. I don't know if you've read his book to Corinthians. It must be around chapter number 7 when he's talking about fornication and young men and how you shouldn't burn and be married. And yes, is it, is it, uh, is it, it is better that for you to have a, a girl or a woman than to burn. And then he says, by the way, this is not the Lord speaking. This is just me speaking as, as the apostle. But guess what? Even what, the one he denies that God is speaking and he gives it to his own words and and ideas is embedded in the scriptures. Oh, hallelujah. Come on, somebody say hallelujah. I said somebody say hallelujah. So the scribe, that's what I'm looking for. That you will be found as a scribe, an entity that is so attached to the flow of the word of God and the book that you and the book will become as one. That's how Jesus teaches in the New Testament. He says, me and the Father are one. Apparently, it was for such a perceived heresy that they decided to crucify him. And yet everything he was saying was true. I and my father are one. He said, this temple you see, where I can bring it down in three days and I'll bring it up again. Glory to God. Of course, because of the myopia on their revelation, they thought he was talking about the temple. Glory to God. They did not have the revelation of Paul that we are the temple of the Holy Ghost. And yet what he spoke concerning his own body is actually what happened indeed about the temple. Glory to God. Because 70 years later, Ah, the Jews revolted and the Romans came down on them uh, very massively under the sergeant I think called Antonia and the history has it that when they landed in Jerusalem they overturned the temple that no stone was left upon another. Why? Because the temple as it had been revived by Herod had been literally painted with gold between the stones if you understand and they melted it down so that they can carry the gold bringing to pass the words of Jesus that not even a stone will be left upon another. Oh, shahalela. Come on, somebody say hallelujah. When you talk serious relationship, relationship that goes beyond engagement, and this is the order to engage. When those declarations are made before the public, one of the phrases they use is that I forsake all others. I commit myself to you and to you alone until death do us part. Let's do it in full. They say, I so-and-so, take you so-and-so to be my lawfully wedded wife. Uh, for richer, for poorer, in sickness and in health. I mean, a yada, yada. You are not getting married. Some of you may be catching the dream right now. Let me slow you down. But listen to me. <laughs> listen to me. Listen to me. Listen to me. It is so intense that you must go through a covenant declaration like that. What am I trying to say here today? That your engagement with a book must get to that level. Hallelujah. I talk 
talked about sola scripture the other day. Sola scriptura, simply meaning that the book, the scriptures, and the scriptures only. That it becomes a plumb line that judges everything else that comes in my life. Whether I go to school and sit before a lecturer, when they bring the ideas of Charles Darwin, I can judge them and judge them right. When I listen to, uh, uh, to, to Margaret Sanger, that the woman of God was talking about here, I can judge her and judge her with precision and with all right, whether it's pro-life or pro, uh, pro-choice. pro The idea here is not what is being told from what part of the world. It's actually what does the book say. Let's go down to the ink. It's like in the court of law. They don't just make a decision because of the judge's emotions. Every decision is going to be based on evidence. And not just every evidence, but evidence that demands a verdict. Hallelujah. Qualified evidence that demands a verdict. And when that evidence is presented and the judge is finally writing his rule, he's going to make reference. And it says, as it were, in the case of Bar 4 versus Bar 4 of 1948. I'm sure I have some lawyers in the house. Evidence that demands a verdict. Your relationship begin to throw evidence around your lifestyle because the book has placed a burden of weight of burden on you. In the in the in the law language, they call it the, the burden of, uh, of evidence. The burden of proof. Thank you. Glory to God. It is your burden to prove that it is what you say it is. Blessed be the mighty name of Jesus. I say hallelujah. She talked about God dancing and moving his foot as the beat of your music began to play. Let me tell you something. In music, they call it a tango. And apparently, you can't tango solo. The problem is that many of you have been solo, dancing through all your life. That's why your dance is so boring, ineffective, no efficaciousness of any kind, because you are dancing solo. I mean, you're boring. You, we can't give you a standing ovation. You can't even catch our attention. Because your moves by yourself, as a matter of fact, they are not only boring to us, but they are frustrating to you. Hey, come on, somebody say, hey, hey, hey. But you know the magic to life is when you finally find that partner that we describe as the book here today that he begins to tango with you. Give you a move that way and you go that way. You begin to feel the symphony of music. It is beautiful because now it is better together. Hallelujah. Now apparently when you tango, like I told you the other day, dancing is one of my problems. But when you see them that do it so well, there may be two of them, but they fit so nice that when they go that way, you see like one person because one is dissolved in another with the shadow. I imagine a day where your life is so dissolved in the shadow of the book that when we see you, we hear the voice of God. Even when you joke, we hear the voice of God in your joke. I stopped joking around with people a lot because I realized my jokes were so serious. I would joke with somebody and say, you'll get twins. Boom, they get twins. I joke with somebody and say, by this time next year, boom, by next time next year, glory to God. Because God takes my ideas seriously because my element of thought and declaration has been borrowed by my friend who has become my dancing partner. Hallelujah. I say, ha, ha, hallelujah. Now, that dance, as you know, sometimes, I mean, when you see them dance, I don't know if you've seen them. You've seen them, some of them are French and some Spanish do that very well. The tango, they play, they play and they move. And then the guy lets the girl go and the hair goes down. I mean, it looks so beautiful and romantic, but in reality, it is high risk. It looks like she's about to hit her, her, her head on the floor. But as she goes at 45, the hand is there to catch her. They spin around on one leg. Then the guy somersaults. I mean, you look at them like, angels. I don't know if you feel me like I feel it. Glory. Hallelujah. I say hallelujah. You are going to be the partner caught by the book. Sometimes fate will take you so high and then bring you so low. The whole world screams. They feel like you're about to hit the floor. Your cousins and your aunties do not understand your life because by their level, you are supposed to be sinking. But before you touch the floor, the book is right there. Lift you up again. Shake you around. Lift off your hair. Give you color. Give you rhythm. Give you honor. Give you beauty. The 
next thing is a standing ovation. Somebody say hallelujah. Ah, say, say hallelujah. My call to relationship with a book is intense and serious because that's going to be your connection into the realities of the divine. To the realities of the divine. Into the realities of the divine. Let me give you food for thought as well. When you don't relate, which is to communicate, you actually abominate. Shahalela. He says in one of the Proverbs that the prayer of the wicked is an abomination before the Lord. The guy is sacrificing incense, but when it comes to the nostrils of God, he's like, slay that one. I don't want to see that one. And they are doing sacrifice. There's a gentleman called Uzzah, the movement of the tabernacle or the Ark of the Covenant. He lifted up his hand to try to be able to be of help in the movement of the grace of God because of David's own error. And he could have left it for God to sort it out because God God will not let, let his presence touch the floor. Hallelujah. He tried to stretch his hand and the Bible say God made a breach upon Uzzah. That's the King James. In other words, the guy died. The place was called, I think, Uzzah Perazim from that day. And, and David is tormented and tried out. Glory to God. I want to draw you to the place of relating and communicating rather than abominating. So that your sacrifice is not denied. The Bible says sacrifice and, uh, and uh, uh, sacrifice and what? And, uh, and uh, uh, sacrifice and uh, uh, what does the King James say? But you sacrifice and I did not desire. What is that? Your, 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 your offering and sacrifice I did not desire. There is no pleasing in what we call our own sacrifice. Glory to God. That's why the blood of bulls and goats would never be enough. That's why the blood of a man would never be enough. It would take the blood of God. And God has to become a man so that he shed the blood that carries the DNA of God. That's the kind of blood that qualifies the demand of our sin and sacrifice. How can he put down so much and you still relegate that relationship to one of the things that have no value in your life. I mean, the Bible declares that we have been saved uh, not by, uh, by corruptible things such as gold or silver or the blood of bulls and goats. Somebody say hallelujah. But by the precious blood of the Lamb of God, it is the blood without blemish. Hallelujah. It's a blood without blemish. And that has been the ultimate sacrifice. Glory to God. So we see Israel here in his commitment as a scribe. That he will write on the behalf of God. That he will not only be a priest, but he will write on the behalf of God. And that his writing will ultimately become the declaration of what God is saying to his generation. That the king will refer to him as the scribe. I, I want you to see the depth of romance in the spirit of this man with a God he has never seen with his eyes. I mean, these guys walked by faith before we could ever teach New Testament faith. Oh, hallelujah. Shadows, pictures, and types, they are. And yet in the reality of their day, that's intense revelation of a display of a relationship to a God with whose eyes you have never seen. His singular focus, his philosophy of life and ministry is a commitment to a God with all of his life. He was a man of one thing, and that thing was the book. We can call him the man of the book. If you study well, you'll discover that he was in the book for 14 years before the crowd would begin to cry for it. 14 years. 14 years. 14 years focused on one thing, that the presence of God will finally break down in your generation. Some of us, three weeks later, we're already changing up and giving up on God and saying, Lord, it's been three weeks. I'm not yet married. Since the guy left me, I'm still, I mean, I'm saying, uh, now you can flip and do all your things, but I tell you, <laughs> I tell you what, God is a lover and not a magician. So he's not responding to your emotions. He's actually responding to the retrospect of uh, your faith 
faith. Glory to God. It is your faith that is touching, putting God into rhythm and into beat that God will begin to play around with you in response to the demand of his word. One great preacher of the 18th century, George Whitefield, he writes in his journal that they marked you must be born again. And he said, preaching to the coal miners in Scotland whose faces were covered with black soot, I would see white channels created on their faces by the trail of their tears as I preached them tonight, as I preached to them last night. How intense can be relationship with the word of God and with the book that you hear it and you cannot stop tears from flowing on your face. Soot is all over you. A, a representation of the trials of this world and the afflictions of this world. The beating of this world. I mean the trouble that has happened to us so intense and so magnanimous that some of us look so black in the spirit and completely overwhelmed by the burdens that we carry. And yet when the word begin to flow, tears will begin to come before our eyes that, our, that roads and trails will be seen in our face because the heart is crushed into life and the eyes must respond. You know that they said the eyes are the windows of the soul. Do you remember that? The eyes are the windows of the soul. I look at you and wonder because the last time you cried you were a seven and a half year old kid and it broke you so hard you said I will never cry again. Ah. Ah, yeah, yeah, yeah. The guy sang and said, all my life I've had to fight. And he said, I've come to the point in my, I mean, I don't care anything. Whatever it is, bring it on. Because the sense of heart and life and relationship is gone. Like the woman that has been denied, betrayed and abused by many men. And he said, I don't care about that anymore. The heart that God created to be of flesh has become as of stone. And it doesn't matter what you do, they can never be more. I told you I'm a prophetic preacher now and look straight forward if I'm talking to you. May the word of God begin to crack that nut, begin to crack that stone, begin to crack that stone which is a reflection of your law and your adjudications by your order and your judgment of your human life that tears of life and grace will begin to flow on your life again. In the mighty name of Jesus, I decree and I prophesy it in the name of the Lord. Somebody say hallelujah. I'm sure you had Jeremiah prophesy as well as Ezekiel that it shall come to pass in that day, referring to the New Testament after the new birth experience and the sacrifice at Calvary. He said, in that day it shall come to pass that your heart of stone, I will break it and I will give you a heart of flesh that will know my law that nobody will need to ever teach you again. It's Ezekiel 11 and 19. I read for you. I will give them a new heart. I will give them one heart. I will put a new spirit within you. I will take away the stony heart out of their flesh. I will give them a heart of flesh. They will walk in my statutes. They will keep my ordinances. They will do them and they shall be my people and I will be their God. Lift your hand and say hallelujah. That is deliverance by relationship in the book that it begin to crack you. My Nigerian brothers say when you break the coconut, the juice begin to flow. I see the juice of your life begin to flow yet again because the coconut is broken. Bible declares we have this treasure in other vessels that the excellency of the power might be of God. All the excellency of the glory and the grace of God. God that has been absent in your life because you've not even been able to see it because of the hardness of your heart, because of the troubles of your life, because of the sickness in your life. You've been a sickler all your life. You've had to fight devils all your life. You've been to struggle through life to where you are. You've never been to stand up straight in the spirit. You always crawl. You walk on your belly like a serpent because of the serpent and spirit that have kept you under all of your life. I tell you what, your heart of stone shall be made a heart of flesh. You will receive his statutes, which is the book. You will keep his ordinance, which is the book. And they shall be my people, and I will be their God. 
Jeremiah 31 and 33, 34. But this shall be the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel. After those days, saith the Lord, I will put my law in their inward parts. That's your spirit. I will write it on their hearts. I will be their God. They shall be my people. They shall teach no more every man his neighbor. And a man his brother saying, know the Lord. Know the Lord. For they shall know me from the least of them to the greatest among them, saith the Lord. I will give them. I will forgive them them their iniquity and I remember their sins no more. Look at your neighbor and say, know the Lord. I'm beyond that because I'm in relationship. As a matter of fact, that word know there, as you know, if you've heard a little bit of that teaching, is the word that Adam knew Eve and she conceived and bore yet another son whose name was saved. Know the Lord. Know the Lord. That conception will erupt. I'm telling you, some of you have never been spiritually pregnant in terms of what God wants to do, in terms of purpose, in terms of destiny. She talked about you that sleep until the sun is bibbing midday with all the Jerusalem heat. That's when you wake up masquerading as someone that has a destiny trying to go find some things in the market i tell you what god is going to heal you so big and your heart is going to be yet tender remember ezra prepared his heart to seek the lord in the preparation of your heart to do the will the counsel of god you're going to get pregnant not with twins but with papas papas will drive you like a madman i say papas will drive you like jehu the man of old he came in a chariot and they would see. They say, I see the dust. It must be the driving of Jehu because he drives like a madman. You've been too simple, too easy in your life. You are so indifferent and you so don't care that you can't touch a soul, can't touch a life. Even your own family can't believe. Even when you talk about knowing God, it is a joke because there's nothing about your life that compares with what they expect to be a reality of one that knows the Lord. Tonight is that last day because God is going to arrest you with relationship. Glory to God. I say glory to God. Today I declare your incarceration. Today I declare you are living here with your hands bound like this. One prophet said that uh, that uh, that uh, we are prisoners of hope. I don't know if you hear what I'm saying. You are going to leave this place tonight imprisoned because of hope and because of purpose that you will not continue to live indifferent without caring about life as if it doesn't matter. Let's eat and drink lest tomorrow we die. That is not your portion and I degrade and completely upgrade you from that kind of mediocre thinking into the platform of purpose and grace based on the book. Somebody say hallelujah. I say hallelujah. Romans 10 and 17. She mentioned it already earlier. He said faith cometh by hearing and hearing by the word of God. Give it to me in the King James here. Let me do a little lesson. So then faith cometh. So then faith cometh. All right. Easy worship doesn't do what I want you to see. But the Bible says for faith cometh by hearing and hearing by the word of God. If you're reading King James on paper or digital here, the word cometh will be in italics. Kamet will be in italics. Every time you read King James and find italics, though if you had no idea, that is the word that has been imparted there by the interpreters so that the context can make sense by reason of language. Because there are certain things in a certain language. If I speak my mother tongue, there are certain things I don't have to put there and you will understand what I'm saying. But you translate it in English, it's going to be broken because it looks like there is a word missing. All right? In mother tongue, you say, my wife. But in English, it will not make sense because you have to say, this is my wife. Do you understand? So interpreters then know that you need to add certain things so that the context can make sense. That's why there is a word cometh there. And this appears a lot in the 1611 edition of the King James translation of the Bible. What that means in the original Greek, when they read it, this is what they hear. So then faith by hearing and hearing by the word of God. Say together with me. So then faith. By hearing and hearing by the word of God. That means that faith equals hearing. The interpreter says it comes by hearing. But I think it's deeper than coming. Of course you understand what whatever comes goes. All right. So if you don't hear, faith goeth. If you hear, faith cometh. In the original time, faith by hearing. 
I don't think you understand what I'm saying. Let me try one more time. I've heard the, uh, the street people say, uh, motivational speakers, they say, fake it until you make it. Fake it until you make it. I'm not talking fake business here. I'm talking faith business here. Faith it by the word of God. Faith by hearing the word. When you hear the word, you are faithing whatever you're trusting God for. And you faith it by the word. It brings it into manifestation. That's a different level altogether. A different denomination. A different paradigm from faking it. Are you listening to what I'm talking about here? So then faith cometh or faith by hearing and hearing by the word of God. I was talking to the marriage the other day. The night we arrived and I said something amazing. Picked from this scripture here. That the word used for faith is the word pistis. Pistis, meaning the power to believe. The opposite of pistis in the Greek is the word apistia, which means a lack of faith or unfaithfulness. So we deduce a conclusion, therefore, that to have no faith is to be unfaithful. Therefore, every idolater, meaning one without faith, serving other gods, is actually an uh, adulterer. I don't know if you, you uh, just maybe have, could have confused you already, but without faith in God means you serve other gods. For you to serve other gods away from the God that created you and demanded your life and asked for a relationship makes you an adulterer. Every time in the scriptures when Israel turned away from God, he did not say they are faithless. He said they've committed wardom, which is adultery. He found them at the, at the, at the bottom of Mount Sinai with the golden calf and they were playing and dancing committing adultery among themselves before the calves they created and said these are our gods that brought us out of the land of Egypt when I ask for your relationship tonight with a book can I shock you I'm calling you out of adultery at the spiritual level that you will serve no foreign God, but he that died for you, created you, and gave you an opportunity for life. Now, let me upgrade it and also tell you that if you'll deal with it in the spirit, it will naturally break in the natural. All of a sudden, because you are a one God kind of man, a one book kind of man, you are original, naturally and, uh, and uh, by all means are going to become a one woman kind of, you're going to be surprised that all of a sudden you only have feelings for one and you don't care about the rest. You see them beautiful. They look amazing. They are carved like a BMW, but you bless them and say, God bless you. He's going to give you a good man. I got me one, and it is all right with me. Because it's not the lust of the eyes, it's not the lust of the flesh, or the pride of life that is governing your life anymore. You've been committed to a God that has aligned your life out of adultery because you're out of idolatry to serve the living God. Put your hands together, give him praise. In the name of Jesus. Oh, hallelujah. I say hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. Somebody say hallelujah. hallelujah. Hosea prophesied it like this. He says, so to yourself in righteousness that you may reap in mercy. Break up your fallow ground for it is time to seek the Lord until he may come and rain righteousness upon you. Now that of course has been made manifest in Christ Jesus but many of us have not seen that rain of righteousness fall. It is called the latter rain. It is the rain of the grace of God coming on your life to give you capacity that is beyond the human ability. To give you understanding that is beyond on human comprehension to give you ability in the spirit to achieve God's order, God's want, God's will and God's desire. Romans 12 and 1, I beseech thee brethren that you conform not yourself to the standard of this world but rather be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind that you may do what? That you may know what is the good the pleasing and the perfect will of God for your life for that is your sacrifice. Glory to God. That is your act of service according to the NIV. Somebody say hallelujah because God is calling. He says come out from among them and be a separate. I will be your God and you will be my people. He's demanding a relationship that will take you deeper into production, into process, into empowerment, into livelihood. Ladies and gentlemen, your wealth and riches is in the solo experience of God with a man. Yes. You look for wealth all your life and you'll die a poor man. Make up your mind to look for God and he will serve you on a silver plate. 
Hallelujah. I say hallelujah. Have you seen people that chase life all of their lives and when they go six feet under the ground, it looks like they were never able to achieve anything. Many of them on their best deathbed, they finally recover and remember if there is a God in heaven, please call, please pray for me. I, I had one of them as he calls God, he says, call my lawyer and call my accountant because, I mean, they've deceived him all his life. The lawyer on the left, the accountant on the right. I think he said something like, I want to die like Jesus between two thieves. Bring the accountant on the right, bring the lawyer on the left. Glory to God. But you can live a life richer and larger than that. Do you know Isaiah prophesied and he said it like this. He said, come and buy without money. He said, why do you spend money on that which is of no profit? He said to her guy, you put your money in pockets without holes. Holes like graves that never get satisfied. Come and buy. I proclaim like a herald without money. Somebody say hallelujah. He takes them to a land that flows with milk and honey. They did not desire it. They did not plan for it. They don't have the blueprint for it. God is giving to, to them by the covenant of promise that if you will love me and be my people, this is your heritage. This is your heritage. There are some blessings you're going to walk into, not because you worked so hard, not because you sweated so hard, not because so and so was your father, but simply because you chose to believe God. You chose to believe God. You chose to believe God. Let me tell you something. For example, there's nothing you can ever do in your life, in your natural life, to end up with a good man as a husband. I don't know one that you can do. I could give you pointers and ideas here and there, and including the ones that you know your makeup is not good enough. I mean, you could reduce your dress into the belt, the size of a belt. Even that is not good enough. Ayaga yaga la ba subrides. Hale say hallelujah. You could go learn to cook and to bake. I mean, you turn around the chapati like you're the master toaster, and the guy will still leave the house and go eat katogo from another woman you have no idea about. Hallelujah. So the blessing of that nature, therefore, is only going to flow because the hand of God is on you. I would like to hear your story. And there are more things you can't explain than the things you can explain. You talk about your marriage, your wife, your husband, how they came, how you ended up together. And you can boldly say, you know what? I have very little to say about that. Because God Almighty did by himself. As a matter of fact, if it was my, my, my reasoning and by my ingenuity, I, that would never have been my choice. But look what the Lord has done. It is marvelous. It in my eyes. Somebody say hallelujah. hallelujah. The draw into the book is the cry that is in the book of Jonah. The Hebrew word is the word kar, meaning to cry out, cry aloud, roar and proclaim. Verse chapter number three and verse number two. Arise, go to Nineveh, the great city, and preach to them the preaching that I bid thee. That is the burden of the Lord. Listen to verse number four. And Jonah began to enter into the city a day's journey and cried and said, yet forty days and Nineveh shall be overthrown. Of course, God turned the script around and began to save his people because at the end of the day, he loves to give them life than the power he has to destroy them. That's a lover. Lift your right hand and say, I'm a lover. I'm a giver. I'm a forgiver. As we talk these things, some of you are shy to declare because your heart has been so battered, you don't consider yourself a lover. Talk loud. Let it come out of your mouth. Let the devils hear it. Dead, born, and unborn, and living in heaven and on earth and under the earth. Say, I'm a lover. Say, I'm a forgiver. Say, I am a giver because I'm a child of God. Hallelujah. I can already feel something breaking loose in this house. Hallelujah. That's the public declaration of the scriptures. The preaching is a part of it. When we read through and read through and read through, you go home and do private. We come here and do public. We declare it. I mean, he said they read it from morning to midday. Verse number 18, from the first day until the last day. It's so massive, the love and the tenacity for the book that your three verses must make you shy in the spirit. It's a good place to begin, but you can't stay there long enough. Hallelujah. You can't stay there. 
I like Josh Meyer. She said once that you have three big fatty meals every day. Breakfast, lunch, and dinner. Some of your breakfast are three course. Then you come to dinner. I mean, my Nigerian brothers say the stomach, if the stomach had sense, sometimes it would hide behind. But, but it is so without shy, full of arrogance, that even when you've had three meals, three course of each meal, as you walk, it is always straightforward. I'm prone to declare his praise as if to say, I am the man, I am the man, I am the man. Joyce Meyer says three meals, hot meals every day. And you have one little puny duck snack in the spirit in a week called Sunday morning. Their people never touch their Bibles until Sunday. And these days with digital things, they even lie to you that they're in the scriptures in church. And it is Facebook. They, you say, let's open Genesis 1 and 27. You will have dominion. You'll be fruitful, multiply, and have dominion. They have the, the tablets with them. But <laughs> they are liking, disliking. Um, I mean, deception of the highest order. Highest order. I mean, it's not bad enough that you're doing it at home. You can now do it in the church. Right before the pulpit of wood that we saw in the days of Ezra. Come on, somebody. I said, come on, somebody. I said, come on, somebody. Hallelujah. Some of them come and sing big, 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 fat lies. You know you can sing a lie like you can talk a lie. You understand? You look at the guy and say, I really, really love you. And between you, you know you're only interested between her legs. There's nothing like love around here. That's how you come to God. I love you more than anything. And God is looking at you like this is called abominating. You are abominating. It is an abomination. There's no truth in the inside parts. He will take away your heart of stone. Give you a heart of flesh. He said, nobody will teach you anymore. Know the Lord. Do you know what that means? You don't even need a prophet to prophesy. You can wake up in the night with a dream. Like what happened to me last night. And you know God is speaking. Something special. Direction clear. I mean, it's amazing when you walk with the Lord. Sometimes I wake up and I know so-and-so is going to come and they need money. This amount of money. Around 10. And in the dream, God showed me the whole script. And he told me, naturally, you don't want to give it to them. But it is me. Give it to them. I usually tell my wife for purposes of confirmation. And at 10, the office, the door is knocking. Who is there? The same lady I mentioned. What do they want? I already know. Before they finish the story, I tell them, don't worry. God has already talked with me. It is all right. It's a good life to live. I can't imagine how you live by chance. Helter skelter. You're like our brothers in Nairobi in Kibra. They call it hope, skip, and jump. As they walk through there, I said, it is always hope, skip, and jump. And you don't know as you hope and skip and jump. We are going to land. Missiles are flying up, up here. They're called flying toilets. Others are already down here in the gutters. You don't know whether it is the one above that will catch you or the one below. Glory to God. Let me tell you something. You can live an abundant life. That's why Jesus died. That you may live an abundant life. You can live an abundant life. You can understand what tomorrow holds. God can reveal to you what you need to do and what you don't need to do. You will hear a voice in your ear saying, this is the way. Walk ye in it. When you hear it, don't be like the mew or be the, like the horse. Come on somebody, hallelujah. Don't don't be like the mew or be like the horse. God is more interested in guiding your life than you can ever imagine. Than you can ever imagine. And I tell you within your heart is capacity for that experience. That's why every time you hear prophet, you run like uh, you've never been to church. They ask for this kind of offering. You are willing to give double. <laughs> One sister came to me and said, I mean, just pray. I went to this guy, the, the prophet, to pray for my husband. They asked me for half a million Kenya shillings. She says, I needed the man so bad. I didn't have half a million. I raised the money. When I reached 350, I went and negotiated. Maybe these things don't happen in Jerusalem. She went and negotiated so that she can receive that special prayer that releases her husband. Is that abundant life? That sounds to me like life of a scorner. The wise see evil from afar and they hide themselves. The, the good lady said it very well. He said the simple walk on straightforward and they are punished. I think some of the tears you've cried in the last few months 
have actually had nothing to do with the heart of God. It was all basic punishment revealed out of simplicity of life. The degree of your inability to care about what God's consideration is in your life. Come on. Come on, come on. Come on. I think ni mesikia wa swahili wa kisemo na wacha mtoto afanye nini? Ashikeyo wembe. Aha. Akililia wembe. Mpe mwache chike wembe. Hallelujah. <laughs> Hallelujah. First Timothy 4 and 13. The Bible says, until I come, give attendance to the reading and the exhortation to doctrine. Until when? Until I come, give word, attendance to reading and to exhortation and to doctrine. Give attendance. Give attendance. I know you know John 3, 16, but we will read it and read it again and read it again. I know you have a little bit of scripture within you. We will read it again and read it again because we must give attendance to reading, to exhortation, and to doctrine. First Thessalonians 5 and 23, I charge you by the Lord that this epistle be read unto the holy brethren. Somebody say, I charge you that this epistle be read. It must be read because there is no power if it is not read. There is no power if it is not declared. But once it is given a voice, the psalmist said that the angels are his ministering, uh, uh, their flames of fire, and they hearken to the voice of his word. Every time we read it, we put voice to what God has declared. And the process is that once what God has declared has a voice, angels get to work. They get to work. Every one of you has serious angels. Maybe one of these days we'll do a series on the ministry of angels within your life. And yet they have been out of business for as long as your birth years and your birthday. Because every time you open your mouth, it is demons you send to work. You invite them to the attention of your life. Angels have run out of assignment because you've not put the voice of the book. You've not given the book a voice of release. What about Revelations 1 and 3? Blessed is he that readeth, referring to the book, and they that hear the words of this prophecy. He says, and keep those things which are written therein, for the time is at hand. Who are they that read the book? The people of the book. What happens to them? He said, Blessed are they. Blessed is he that readeth. Do you count yourself blessed? Does blessed equal driving a car? Does blessed equal having a new house? Does blessing equal the things you call blessings in your life? If that is the reflection of blessing, then stick to the word. Because any revelation in your mind of what blessing is, is embedded in he that readeth the words and keepeth the words of this prophecy and the things that are written therein. Somebody say hallelujah. I told you I'll keep you short today and I'm doing my best. But I want to give you one more story as I wind out. This is the story of Josiah the king. When you have time, go read 2 Kings chapter number 22. Uh, most of it there. This is a story that happens in the day of the king Josiah. Ah, glory to God. If I may paraphrase it for you, there is a high priest called Hilkiah. He has a scribe he works with called Shaphan. And he, the king has sent them to mobilize the people so that they begin to look for the money uh, wherever it has been in the temple that has been gathered for the fixing of the temple and all of that. And as they go in the search of the gathering of these monies that have been given, uh, they find the book. And in verse number 8 the Bible declares, and Hilkiah the high priest said unto Shaphan the scribe, I have found the book of the law of the house of the Lord. And Hilkiah gave the book to Shaphan and he said, read it. And Shaphan the scribe came to the king and brought to the king word again and said, thy servants have gathered the money that was found in the house and have delivered into the hand of them that do the work that have the oversight over the house of the Lord. And Shaphan the scribe, that's verse number 10, Showed the king saying, Hilkiah the priest had delivered me a book. Shaphan read it before the king and it came to pass when the king had the words of the book of the law that he rent his clothes. And the king commanded Hilkiah the priest and Ahikam the son of Shaphan and Akbor at the son of Melchiah and Shaphan the scribe at the words of the book that they befone that great is the wrath of the Lord that is kindled against us because our fathers have not hearkened unto the words of this book and do not according unto that which is written therein concerning us. Verse number 14. And Hilkiah the priest 
Christ and Ahikam and Akbo and Shaphan and Asahiah went into Huldah, the prophetess, the wife of Shulam, the son of Tikva, the son of Ahahas, keeper of the wardrobe. Now she dwelt in Jerusalem in the college. This is the college of prophets. And they communed with her. And she said unto them, Thus saith the Lord God of Israel, Tell the men that sent you unto me, Thus saith the Lord God. Behold, I bring evil upon this place, upon the inhabitants thereof, even all the words of the book which uh, the king of Judah has read. The, the word of the book which the king of Judah has read. Now, these things are written in the book in the days of Moses. The prophet is saying, Because of the status of Israel now, what you read in the book is what is coming to pass. Come on. This is prior to the days of Nehemiah and Ezra. I don't know if you see what I see. Different generation, many years gone by, and yet it is the same story. They always forget the book. They discard the book. They live with other gods like God never gave them a word, like God never gave them the book. And yet one day, God touches a man's heart. In the days of Nehemiah, it was Ezra the scribe. In the days of King Josiah, it was Helkiah the high priest. Find the book, and every time you find the book, there is national direction. There is a mending of heart. A glory, hallelujah. She goes ahead to say, because they have forsaken me and they've burned incense to other gods, that they might provoke me unto anger with all the works of their hand. Therefore my wrath shall be kindled against them in this place and shall not be quenched. Verse number 18. But unto the king of Judah which sent you uh, to inquire of the Lord, thus shalt thou say to him. Thus saith the Lord God of Israel, as touching the words which thou hast heard, because thine heart was tender. Remember Ezra, he prepared his heart that he may seek the Lord. Because his heart was tender, thou hast humbled thyself before the Lord when thou heardest what I spoke against this place and against the inhabitants thereof. And they that uh, should become of the desolation and should become a curse. And he rent his clothes and wept before me. I also have had thee, saith the Lord. Behold, therefore, I will gather thee to the Thy fathers, and thou shalt uh, be gathered unto thy grave in peace, and thine eyes shall not see all the evil which I'll bring upon this place. And they brought the king word again. Can you imagine it's so intense as far as direction of God is concerned that the prophetess begin to prophesy that as for Josiah the king, he will not see the evil because I will gather him in his place that he be laid with his fathers, and then doom is going to fall. Because they've turned away from the realities of the world, which is the plumb line that governs lives, families, communities, and nations. There is such a thing that God can wind up the life of a man to preserve him from the evil intended of a community because of his righteousness among them. If you look at the story here of the king and what is happening everywhere around him, the only difference is that the priest brought him the word. He received the word. He read the book. He rent his heart. He rent his clothes. He cried before the Lord unto repentance. And God is declaring, you know what? I will not let your eyes see it. But everybody after you is going to suffer the doom of their behavior. Glory to God. I will fast forward a little bit because I said I'm keeping you a little tonight in terms of the larger scope of the things that I wanted to share with you this weekend because the, it's not possible that we can gather the time to comprehend all of this together. But I want to show you something about the book which I would call, if I had time, the personality of the book. In Luke chapter number 4, verse number 17 to 21, Bible declares, and there was delivered unto him, this is Jesus of Nazareth, delivered unto him the book of the prophet Isaiah, which he opened. He opened it in chapter number 61 and he found the place where it is written, the spirit of the Lord is upon me for he hath anointed me to preach good tidings unto the poor. He has sent me to bind the broken hearted proclaim liberty to the captives, the opening of sight to them that are blind, again to minister uh, 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 to, uh, to liberty to them that are bruised and to preach the acceptable year of the Lord and they close the book. Somebody say he closed the book. Come on, somebody say, close the book. Gave it back to the minister, sat down. The eyes of, the, of the everybody in the synagogue was fastened upon him because you cannot leave us so high and dry. Leave such a powerful, read such a powerful text and not say anything about it. In verse number 21, the Bible says, he began to say to them, this day has the scripture been fulfilled before your very own eyes. For the first time, somebody can read the book, close it, and put it down. 
Somebody can read the book, close it, and put it down. The next thing he says, this day, hallelujah, he said, this day has this book been revealed and made manifest before your very eyes. For the first time in history, a personality in the revelation of one called Jesus of Nazareth, the Christos in the Greek, the anointed one, and his anointing is laying claim on the book and is saying whatever you've heard in the book, it is about me. And I am here to proclaim and to declare and to bring to pass what has been said in the book. He said in another place that I did not come to discard or to do away with the law, but I came to fulfill the same. In other words, whatever was prophesied, whatever was declared, I arrive as the fulfillment. That why the, the declarers of time in the calendar, they have a BC and then they have an AD. They have a before Christ and then they have an anno domina, the year of our Lord Jesus Christ. Because in the element of time, everything combines in the revelation of the Christ, the son of the living God. Somebody say hallelujah. He becomes therefore the personality of the book that when I cause and call and provoke your heart into performance, into a relationship with a book, I'm actually calling you to relationship with Jesus of Nazareth. King of kings and Lord of lords, the Bible calls him the bright and the morning star. The lily of the valley. Oh, hallelujah. He introduced himself to the Pharisees. And he said, a greater than Solomon is here. When they talked about David, he called himself the son of David. When they talked about Abraham, he said, I'm the seed. Spora, as we saw yesterday, of Abraham. In John chapter number 4, the woman talks about Jacob's well. He says, uh, uh, before Jacob was, I am. Are you listening to what we are talking about here today? Shagamagamagamagamandela. Brodos Oh, hallelujah. Let me wind it because I said we will wind it. John chapter number 1 and verse number 14. And the word became flesh and dwelt among us and we beheld his glory, the glory as the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and full of truth. Ladies and gentlemen, that's the book. The book becoming flesh, dwelling among us, beholding his glory as the glory of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and full of truth. Ladies and gentlemen, it begins with Jesus because Jesus is a revelation of the book. He's the entire library. The Bible said, if everything that he had done was written and put in the book, there would not be enough space in the world to contain the content of the book because it's the book himself. Are you listening to me? Concerning the Holy Ghost, he said he was anointed with a spirit that is beyond measure. Acts 10 and 38, how God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Ghost and with power when about doing good, healing all those that were sick and all those that were oppressed of the devil. Somebody say, hallelujah. Became flesh, dwelt among us. The writer of the book of Hebrews picks it from the psalmist. And he says in chapter number 10 and verse number 7. He said, then said I, lo, I come. For in the volume of the book, it is written of me. In the in the, talk to me somebody, in the, it is written about who? So the comprehensive volume, like we saw yesterday, as we authenticated what others think is an antiquity of history and approach of, uh, of spiritual history, ladies and gentlemen, the volume of the book, 66 of them, is a representation of Jesus. That's why we all find him in Genesis. 
That's why you'll find him in Exodus. I mean, everywhere you turn, you'll find him. In the law of Moses, you'll find him. In the prophets, you will find him. I mean, Jeremiah said, is there no balm in Gilead? Because the prophetic order was placing a demand to answer the question that there is indeed a balm in Gilead. That would be called Jesus the Nazarene, the child of Mary. I like the way the songwriter writes and asks, Mary, did you know that this little baby you hold would be called the son of God. A miracle worker would walk on water. He's the volume of the book. Somebody say hallelujah. I say hallelujah. I say hallelujah. I don't know what your commitment is tonight, but I want your relationship to come alive yet again. Because we could talk to you until I run out of breath tonight. If your relation does not come alive with a book, which is the representation of the Christ of Nazareth, I tell you for free, what you're living is an empty life. What you're living is a high cost of low living. What you're living, as a matter of fact, is a tragedy. It is tragic to live without Christ. It is so empty, so dry, that it's not worth living another day. But to tap into the wisdom, the revelation of Jesus that is called the Christ, ladies and gentlemen, puts you at a pedestal that causes you to live above the law, larger than life, because he that is on the inside of you is greater than he that is in the world. John, the revelation later wrote in third john he said for as he is glory to god so are we in this world that is the book ladies and gentlemen and if the book says it i believe it that settles it i run with it it comes to pass it's made manifest in my life i don't live a weaker life because i live by the book the book that is the performance of life it is by the book that life is all set together somebody say hallelujah the bible says he was the light of men he was the life of men and that life was light unto men and the light shined and the darkness could not comprehend it that is the book and the demand on the table tonight is a responsibility or a responsibility of your love and commitment to the book in the representation of Christ Jesus our Lord and our God lift your hands and take a moment to worship him